Hello, and welcome to Virtual Worship. I'm Tim, pastor, developer of Hope Palm Springs. You know, Jesus once said, I came into the world so that those who do not see may see. While this time of pandemic has been extremely difficult on us all, I have become aware through conversations with many of you that out of this unusual time, we are all perhaps beginning to see ourselves, one another, and even the world, really, very differently than before. And through that awareness, new revelations about what's most important to us are emerging. Many of you speak of renewed relationships or new discoveries about yourselves, even life lessons that, that you're learning. Some have even shared important lessons that they, they once learned but had completely forgotten, only now to be reminded of them again. How important to be reminded of those things, things that are important to us, things that matter most because it's so easy to forget. It's like we can see what we haven't been able to see before or to see again what we haven't seen for a long time. Well, that's what the bishop is preaching about today in this video. Yes, I've got another Sunday off from preaching. Thank you, Bishop. You'll hear him talk about what God is up to, even behind the scenes of a global pandemic. And while we may not be able to see clearly, I think we might all agree that we are being shaped profoundly by this incredible time in history. And then in spite of the pain, the loneliness, and even the sometimes despair. God is indeed working to bring life in places where there is sickness and death and light to a deep darkness the world is experiencing. So let's spend a few moments centering ourselves to become ready not only to hear the Word of God, but to see perhaps what we haven't seen before or to see again what we haven't seen for a very long time. Open your eyes. God is at work in the world. Welcome to Virtual Worship. The lesson is from the ninth chapter of Acts, verses 1 through 20. Meanwhile, Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus, so that if he found any who belonged to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Now as he was going along and approaching Damascus, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? He asked, Who are you, Lord? The reply came, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But get up and enter the city, and you will be told what you are to do. The men who were traveling with him stood speechless because they heard the voice but saw no one. Saul got up from the ground, and though his eyes were open, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. For three days he was without sight, and neither ate nor drank. Now there was a disciple in Damascus named Ananias. The Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias, he answered, Here I am, Lord. 
The Lord said to him, Get up and go to the street called Straight, and at the house of Judas look for a man of Tarsus named Saul. At this moment he is praying, and he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. But Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard much from many about this man, how much evil he has done to your saints in Jerusalem, and here he has authority from the chief priests to bind all who invoke your name. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is an instrument whom I have chosen to bring my name before Gentiles and kings and before the people of Israel. I myself will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. So Ananias went and entered the house. He laid his hands on Saul and said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on your way here has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately something like scales fell from his eyes, and his sight was restored. Then he got up and was baptized, and after taking some food, he regained his strength. For several days he was with the disciples in Damascus, and immediately he began to proclaim Jesus in the synagogue, saying, He is the Son of God. This is the word of the Lord. Grace and peace to you from God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. It's good to be here with you today. This is the second sermon I have prepared for the Synod, but this sermon's a little different from the one I prepared previously. That sermon was the sermon for the second Sunday of Easter. This sermon is to be used any time in the remaining Easter season in the month of May, which is why I'm wearing white today, Or you could use it during the green season, during Pentecost, whatever will work for your pastor and for your church. I once again am grateful to the people of Claremont Lutheran Church, to Pastor John Doolittle for opening the sanctuary for me to record the sermon, and to a member of Claremont, Eddie McCoven, for being our video recorder and sound man. It's a real great help to have him helping us do this. I don't know about you, but it's been a while since I've had my hair cut. I, um, my hair is looking shaggier and bushier than it has at any other time. I managed during the day to put it down with hair gel and uh, hair paste, but boy, in the middle of the night when I wake up, it can look crazy. The other night I woke up and looked in the mirror and thought to myself, I recognize that hair. That's my hair from the 70s, back at a time when we all kept it longer and unkempt and uncombed. And so I thought, I need to see this in the light. So I turned on the light, put on my glasses, and realized that was not my hair from the 70s. It was not nearly as cool looking, and it had flecks of gray, and underneath it were wrinkles of a man who was closer to his 70s in age than he was back in the 1970s when he was a teenager and in his young 20s. No, it was a very different kind of hair, and it's amazing as I looked at that to think how I thought I saw something from the past, only to realize that times had changed, and I had changed, and it was time to move on. Times have changed for the people of Israel since the death and resurrection of Jesus. Times have changed for Jesus' followers, and little did he know it, but times were changing for a man named Saul. Who was Saul? Saul was a devout, faithful Jew, a worshiper of God, and one who studied the biblical law so much that he thought it was important to keep that law in its purity. And he was enraged by heresies when they arose among the people. And a new heresy, he thought, had arisen. Certain followers of Jesus were saying that Jesus was the Messiah, the Savior God had promised from of old. But Saul looked around him and thought, the world hasn't changed. How can Jesus be the Savior? This must be a lie. And so he did everything he could to stomp out what he considered to be a false narrative. He had even gotten letters from the chief priests to go up to Damascus in Syria, north of north of Judea, north of Israel, north of Galilee, and go to the synagogues there and take away anyone who was spreading the word of Jesus so they could stop this word from spreading any further. But while he was on the road, he suddenly realized that his life was about to change forever. A light flashed around him. He fell to the ground, 
And suddenly he heard a voice. He heard that voice say, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? He said, who are you, Lord? And the worst possible message came back. I am Jesus, the very one you are persecuting. I am real and I am alive and I am here. But get up and go into the town and you will learn there what you are to do. And when Saul got up, he suddenly could not see a temporary physical blindness that mirrored the spiritual blindness that had guided his life for a period of at least a few weeks, maybe months. He got up and was led into Damascus, and there he awaited to see, if you will, what the Lord had in mind. In Damascus was another man named Ananias, who certainly did not want to see what God would have him do. God appeared to Ananias in a vision and said, I have work for you. And Ananias said, okay, Lord, what is it? And the Lord said, I want you to go to this guy named Saul. He's staying here in town, and I want you to lay hands on him so that he may receive his sight. And Ananias says, um, God, I'm not sure you're all that well acquainted with this Saul guy. He's not a good person. He's here to arrest people like me, to drag us out of here. Why would I go voluntarily to be with him? But God says, no, Ananias, go to him. You do not see what I see. You do not know what I know I am about to do. I ask you to trust me in faith and go and lay your hands on him. And then your eyes will be opened and you will see what I will do through him for the sake of the world. You know, Ananias isn't the first person to argue with God and to say to God, you've got it wrong. Or to say to God, I think you're going the wrong way. He's certainly not the per- first person to be blind to what God may be doing in this world. I want to tell you about Cassie. Cassie came to church one day. She was a faithful member of church, was in her women's group, was always there to serve meals at funerals, was part of the quilters, was regularly in Bible study. And every Sunday you could find her in her place, in her pew at church, unless some visitor got there, in which case she sat as close to them as she possibly could, which would have been a hard thing in this day of physically distancing that we're living in today. Cassie came up to her pastor, Pastor Jerry, and she said, Pastor, this is my last day in church. I'm not coming here anymore because I've decided it doesn't matter if I'm here or not. God doesn't listen to my prayers. Pastor Jerry said, what happened, Cassie? Cassie said, I've been praying for the last two years for my daughter Kay. She got involved with this guy. He got her hooked on drugs, and I've been praying daily, hourly, that she will get off of drugs and get into a better life, but things have just gotten worse and worse. A month ago, she was arrested for dealing drugs, and she met with her lawyer a couple of weeks ago and heard that the best she could get was five years in jail with maybe a couple years off early release for good behavior while she's there. And I've been praying and praying that she would be released from this, that she wouldn't have to go through this, that she would get off drugs and amend her life. But yesterday, or rather Friday, was the sentencing, and they took her away. Five years in prison. I prayed and prayed about this pastor, and God didn't listen to my prayers. So I've decided there must not be a God, or if there is a God, that God doesn't listen to anybody like me. And so why should I be here for God? So I'm leaving, and I'm not coming back. And that was the last time that Jerry saw Cassie for a long, long time. Cassie's not the only person to think, God isn't listening to me. Have you ever felt that way yourself? Ever prayed and prayed for something and not known what's going on? Ever thought during this time of pandemic, where are you, Lord? Why aren't you helping the people who are sick? Why aren't you helping nations throughout the world care for people who have this horrible illness? What are you doing? Why aren't you hearing our prayers? Maybe you've been among those who have been blind or seemingly unable to see God at work and active in the world the way it is? If so, you are not alone. There are many people in the Bible who would identify with you. I can think of 11 off the top of my head. 
the 11 disciples of Jesus, who after Judas betrayed him, saw Jesus taken to the cross and wondered, what in the world is God doing? We thought Jesus was the savior of Israel. We thought that this was who God really was. God was one who worked through Jesus to preach good news to the poor, who healed the sick and fed the hungry and was with us in ways that we didn't know God would be with us. We thought this was the savior of the world, only now he's dead and all our hopes and dreams are dashed. Those disciples on that Friday and Saturday just couldn't see what God was up to. Yet on that Sunday, their eyes began to be opened. As Jesus rose from the dead, appeared first to the women disciples, and then appeared to the men, and then began to appear to a bunch more, finally to Saul himself on the road to Damascus. And slowly, one by one, two by two, group by group, person by person, their eyes were opened, and they saw Jesus, and saw Jesus for who he is, one who was there with him, and who would never leave. A few weeks after Jesus' resurrection, Jesus met with those disciples on a mountain in Galilee, and he said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey all that I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. Ever since that time, followers of Jesus have lived by that promise. I am with you always to the end of the age. We don't always see Jesus, but Jesus is always there. Jesus is there with us in this time of pandemic. Jesus is there with us in our times of being physically distant from others that we would love to be with in person. Jesus is there in our homes. Jesus is there wherever we go. Jesus is in our hospitals. Jesus is with those who are dying. And if even death were to take us, Jesus would still be there to bring us from death to life. Jesus is there with you this day. And if you don't see it, that's okay. Because the promise is not dependent on our being able to see it. It's dependent on Jesus who promises to be with us. And we can be assured that in this life, even when we don't see it, God is still at work in and with us. And that at times we get glimpses of how Jesus is there with us. Ananias got a glimpse of Jesus being with him as Saul immediately was not only baptized but began to proclaim the good news of Jesus there in Damascus, uniquely gifted by his training in the law to share the good news of Jesus Christ. Saul saw it in in Jesus who appeared to him on the road, who appeared to him through the work of Ananias, who helped him receive the Holy Spirit and then went out to preach and through Saul who we better know as Paul, who wrote many, many of the letters in our New Testament, that Paul, we know more through him about Jesus than we would know if he hadn't written and hadn't taught us for centuries through this Holy Scriptures. And for Cassie, even for her, there was a time where she caught a glimpse of Jesus as well. About a year after she had left that church, she didn't go to anything, not to Bible study, not to quilters. Her friends would check in on her from time to time, and she was open to them, but she told them she no longer believed and she wasn't going to church. Until one day she showed up, and Pastor Jerry said, Cassie, it's so good to see you. And Cassie said, well, I need to tell you why I'm here, Pastor. I was just a CK in prison the other day, She hadn't wanted me to visit her for most of this first year, but we wrote letters to each other, and finally she said, Mom, I'd really like it if you were to come. And when I came and saw her, she said, Mom, I'm off drugs completely. I'm in recovery. I'm getting my life back together. I'm starting it here in prison, and I need you to pray for me. And Cassie said, I said to her, I don't pray anymore, okay? And Kay said, Mom... I'm depending on your prayers. I need you to pray for me more than ever. You've been praying for a long time that I be drug free, right? And she said, yeah. Well, now I finally am. And now I need your prayers more than ever. Please pray for me. And Cassie came to Pastor Jerry and said, you know, God was at work at Kay. God was at work in ways that I couldn't see. 
My prayers are being answered, just not in my time. And Kay says she needs my prayers more than ever. I got to think that maybe she's right. And maybe God needs me to keep on praying. So I'm back, Pastor Jerry. I'm here to volunteer for whatever you need. I'm back in church. And I'm going to keep my eyes open and see how God may still be at work in ways that I'm not seeing in Kay's life and the lives of others in our church. The truth is that God is with us in ways that we cannot always see. This world is going to change, I think, because of this pandemic. We will be changed. There will be parts of us that look kind of the same, like my hair sort of resembled my hair from the 70s the other night. But we'll turn on the lights and put on the glasses and look more closely and see, oh, we've been shaped and molded. We are different than we were before. But that does not mean bad things will happen. We will learn, as I have seen you, good congregations of Pacific Synod, continuing to learn of new ways that God is with you, of new ways that God is reaching out through you, of new ways that your hope is renewed and restored by the God who continues relentlessly to be with you because God has promised to be with you and God will never leave you. That God is with you this day and always. And even though we and the world may change, we will still have God with us. And God will help us to live through those changes, celebrate them, find the good in them, and see God continually being at work. Good people of Pacifica Synod, God bless you in this time of pandemic. God strengthen you to do the work that you need to do God grants you all that you need physically, emotionally, financially, spiritually to get through this time. But always, always remember the promise. God is with you no matter what. And God will be with you this day, tomorrow, and always. In the name of God, our maker, of Christ who died on the cross for us, and the Holy Spirit who sanctifies us and fills us with God's grace. Amen. Set your seal upon my